Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. I'm your co-host, Dr. Jessica Steyer. And I'm your other co-host, Dr. Andrea Love. Okay, Andrea, episode two. Uh, So today we'll be covering how do vaccines work in establishing immunity to disease? So before we dive in, I thought we could start today's episode with a little bit of an icebreaker like we did last week. Um, And could you tell us a little something, uh, maybe something interesting that happened at work this week for you? Yeah, um, Jess, I'd be happy to do that. So as our listeners maybe know by now, uh, I'm an immunologist. I work for a biotech company. And um, even in the time of COVID-19, us scientists are still getting very creative with how we do our work. So we've been doing a lot of things virtually that maybe we used to do in person. And and one of those things are research conferences. So earlier this week, I was at a research conference, um, a technology symposium, and I actually gave a presentation on a methodology to screen potential influenza vaccine candidates. Um, So it's a new way to run high throughput experiments to identify potential vaccine um, candidates for influenza. But of course, that could be expanded to other types of vaccines. And I thought it was really appropriate because, of course, we're entering flu season. Um, The flu shot is widely available. We're obviously recommending people to get that vaccine. And of course, today our topic happens to be vaccines. So I thought that was pretty appropriate timing. Um, what is <laughs> <laughs> sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, um, what about you, Jess? Oh, well, actually just to comment on what you just said, that's a awesome and B yes, very timely because as folks may have seen, I posted a very dorky photo of myself getting my flu shot yesterday. Um, and we obviously highly recommend that folks do the same. Uh, Andrew, I know we were saying that the optimal time to get it would be now through the end of October, right? Absolutely. And and we're definitely going to cover this more in depth on a probably influenza specific episode. But um, the reason for that is because The uh, immunity for the influenza vaccine in particular um, lasts for about six months, and peak flu month in the U.S. at least is uh, February. So you want to make sure that you have that protection all the way through, you know, the end of February into March. And Andrea, just a quick thank you. I saw that uh, you interacted with my mom who said that she got her shot in August and you were saying that might have been a little early and maybe she should get a booster. I think I don't know if you said in January or something like that. So yeah, absolutely, especially for for people that may be considered more high risk for influenza and of course, COVID-19. Um, you know, August is a, a little on the early side. So yeah, um, it's if she can find, um, you know, available vaccine in January, it's never a bad idea. There's not going to be any sort of detrimental effect to boosting that. Well, it definitely pays to be friends with an immunologist. So (laughs) thank you. (laughs) So um, let's see what happened this past week. So uh, as I mentioned last week, I am the co-founder and CEO of a public health consultancy. Uh, We specialize in um, health research and data analytics. We're actually working with a large uh, FQHC, Federally Qualified Health Center in New York State, uh, to do a zero survey uh, for so basically COVID antibody research study among their employees. And um, for those who don't know, just really quickly, an FQHC is a community-based healthcare provider. They receive funds from the federal government to provide primary care services typically in um, underserved areas. And so we're working with them to do this research. And uh, for a couple of months, now we've been collecting the data. So their employees have gone and and received their antibody tests. And we've just stopped the data collection. We're about to dive into analysis. So really excited about that. That's, uh, you know, gold for public health scientists is to actually dig into the data. So very exciting stuff. That's really Uh, exciting. I remember (laughs) the early stages when we were discussing with that healthcare organization about the utility of the serology study. So I'm really, I'm really excited to see that data. 
Yeah. And, you know, just on that note, as we said, I think we briefly touched on this last week is, you know, there's not a lot of utility in the antibody tests at the individual level. If you get a positive test, what does that really mean? It's not going to change. It shouldn't change your behavior. You shouldn't, you know, stop wearing masks or, as I said, you know, throw parties or whatever it is. Uh, But at the population level, that data, uh, those data are very, very useful to really understand the footprint of COVID-19. So very, very, excited about digging into that uh, that data. So Andrea, should we, would you like to give a recap maybe of last week's episode? Sure. Yeah. So um, on last week's episode, we quickly touched on uh, the different types of immune systems. So we talked about the innate versus the adaptive immune system, um, in particular focus on the adaptive immune system and how that would play a role in a COVID vaccination. Um, And so here, obviously, it's very appropriate and relevant um, because we're going to talk about vaccination at large. Um, And of course, if you want all the nitty gritty, go listen to Is There Antibody Out There? uh, Episode one. (laughs) But um, very quickly, the adaptive immune system is the branch that establishes our memory immunity, our long term immunity. And that's comprised of B cells, which make antibodies, and then T cells, which there are two classes are uh, helper T cells and our cytotoxic T cells. Ultimately, all of these players in the adaptive immune system have to collaborate together in order to um, establish very potent and long-lasting immunity. Um, And it's this goal of vaccination to activate and prime the adaptive immune system in order to establish that immunity without having the detrimental effects of natural infection. Um, So that's pretty much my very, very high level summary. Um, But on today's episode, we're going to cover what a vaccine actually is, how they work and how they ultimately provide immunity to disease. Um, We will discuss different types of vaccinations um, and what sorts of diseases they protect against and ultimately wrap up with a primer on why it is very critical for folks to get vaccinated. Um, I'm going to hand the floor to Jess now to give us a public health preface on the importance of vaccines from a community health perspective. Well, Andrea, before I do that, do you know that you are co-hosting with a rebel (laughs) <laughs> um, oh, I, <laughs> I was actually kicked out of a mom group last year for being too passionate about vaccine research. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you know that. I kind of wear that as a badge of honor. Um, but yeah, I guess I was uh, really... Uh, uh, p- pissing people off <laughs> who, who, who don't, uh, I don't know, who, who don't fully understand um, the, you know, the utility of vaccines. So this is something that I'm really passionate about. I was actually accused of weaponizing my credentials, Andrea. I'm sure uh, you've been accused oh, yeah. of, of, of the same. But um, anyway, so I, I've i taught coursework in preventative medicine and epidemiology. And, and really, I, I give the same spiel uh, to my students that I'll give here. And, and that's, I, I think that vaccines and antibiotics are really the two main uh, you know, public health breakthroughs that altered the course of history. Absolutely. And uh, how did I know that you'd agree, Andrea? <laughs> <laughs> so weird. But, I went into microbiology and immunology as a field. <laughs> But, you know, I feel like they, they're they really underappreciated because it's so much easier to measure the presence of disease than the absence of it. And so um, I, I think we should sort of t- take a moment to think about all of the millions of deaths every year that are prevented by vaccines. So the World Health Organization estimates that immunizations currently prevent two to three million deaths every single year. Um, And, you know, if people aren't dying, we also have to think about long-term disability that may come as a result of some of these vaccine-preventable diseases. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, But it's really true what they say. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, Andrea, people are always asking us, 
how do we boost our immune systems? Is there a way to protect ourselves to boost our immune systems? And I know that we're going to cover that in a lot of detail on a future episode. Um, but let's just say, you know, there, there's no magic bullet, of course, but there is a, a an industry, an over $30 billion industry right now um, that's selling immunity boosters. So when people ask us this, um, my typical response is, you know, eat, eat a good, healthy diet get sleep, uh, try to manage stress as best as possible, and get your vaccines. <laughs> we have these, they they really are these magical things that help prevent disease. It's the single easiest thing that we could do. In my mind, it's a lot easier than eating healthy. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and sure. exercising. My, my, my regular diet of Ben and Jerry's every night would agree with that. Well, you're like a marathoner, Andrea, so I don't even want to hear it from you, but 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 it's true, really. Vaccines are, you know, it's low-hanging fruit. This is an easy way for us to quote unquote bolster our immune system. I know we don't love that term, but we'll 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 talk more about that in a future episode. Let's talk about a case study um, of the measles resurgence in the United States. So measles, they really weren't around, and that's thanks entirely to vaccines. But then in 2019, we saw a real spike. So there were almost 1,300 individual cases of measles uh, that were confirmed across 31 states in the U.S. Um, of these cases, 128 were hospitalized, 61 reported having complications, including pneumonia and encephalitis. These are not things that you want to mess around with. Um, and this was the greatest number of cases reported in this country since 1992. Uh, the large majority of these cases were linked to uh, to outbreaks in religious communities in New York. Um, these were pockets of the population who were not vaccinated against measles. So we know that measles is more likely to spread and cause outbreaks uh, in communities where groups of people are unvaccinated. And Jess, I just want to jump in and, and really emphasize that point. So measles is a highly contagious disease. Uh, and the reason we don't see the number of cases that we used to is solely due to those vaccines. Um, the, the reluctance of some of these populations to vaccinate is only going to continue to lead to more increased outbreaks. Um, and if we had fewer people that were vaccinated in these populations, we're going, we would expect to be seeing many more cases. So I think it's really critical to emphasize that, um, you know, some people might say 1,300 isn't that many cases, but considering that um, we used to have almost none in a population since we released that vaccine, um, it's very concerning. Absolutely. If you look at a, at a chart over time, you'll see this major spike. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I feel like this... Um, uh, we're, there's a growing sentiment in this country, you know, of... Um, hesitation around vaccines and people, more and more people are not getting vaccinated. Kids are going unvaccinated. And so I think, unfortunately, this trend is only going to continue. Um, okay, so let's kick off a new segment, which we're very excited about, called Heard from the Herd, where we will answer a question that was sent in from one of our listeners. This week's question is one that we receive quite frequently, and it's, can I get sick from a vaccine, specifically with the disease that the vaccine is trying to prevent? And I think that this is really a perfect segue into our next topic, Andrea, how do vaccines elicit immunity and the different types of vaccines? So do you want to take us through this? Okay, so I'm going to start with just a little refresher on... Um, how we mount that memory immune response. Um, but ultimately, the goal of a vaccine is to establish that long-term immunity without having the risks associated with a natural infection. So that, of course, could be uh, death, but it could also be long-term complications as a result of infection. Um, we see that in a variety of viral infections like uh, chicken box, which can actually reactivate as shingles later in life, um, or Epstein-Barr virus that can actually reactivate as a uh, cancer, a type of cancer. Um, so we want to ultimately prevent those types of things. Um, what the vaccine does is they mimic that natural infection um, through masquerading as the actual pathogen. So the pathogen is the disease-causing 
um, you know, microorganism. And so the vaccination is going to lead to that adaptive immune response. And the adaptive immune response is um, components from both B cells and T cells. So B cells are those cells that um, produce the antibodies that we need to help neutralize the pathogen, so the virus or the bacteria. Um, and then the T cells help provide additional memory components through the cell-mediated immunity. Um, and so typically when you're getting that vaccination, you're going to have that initial response, the delayed response um, that takes a few days to, to prepare for. And then by the time you actually encounter the actual disease, you have that memory and you're ready to mount a response right away. So you're not going to actually get sick from the disease itself. Okay, that's that's helpful, Andrea. And I just want to recap for folks. Um, again, remember, I'm looking to you as my immunology TA here. So when we're talking about B cells, T cells, I just want to confirm these are white blood cells. Um, they are the soldiers of our immune system, and they're intended to defend us from disease. Is that right? Yeah, essentially. So in our immune system, um, all of our cell components, aside from a few that we're not going to get into too much, are considered white blood cells. That actually includes cells from the innate immune system as well. But in the adaptive immune system, your B cells and your T cells are both white blood cells. They're actually both a class called lymphocytes. So it's B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, but we simplify by just saying cells. Um, so yeah, so they're patrolling our bodies and they're the ones that are sounding the alarm and preventing these infections from taking root. Um, and so a vaccine allows us to do that um, in advance so that if we did ever encounter the actual disease causing organism, we wouldn't physically get ill because we'd already have the recognition and the memory for that pathogen. Got it. Okay. So is now a good time to talk about the different types of vaccines? Yeah, I think so. So as I was saying, um, Jess, the the vaccination principle is to mimic or masquerade as the actual disease causing organism, or I use the word pathogen a lot. So a pathogen is a microorganism that actually causes disease. We have microorganisms that don't cause disease, so we don't call those pathogens. But um, ultimately, these vaccine components have to do a pretty effective job at mimicking that so that we mount an appropriate immune response. So if it's not similar enough to the actual disease, uh, we won't mount an appropriate immune response, and then we won't have protection. So the, the four main classes of vaccines that are available now are, are what we call live attenuated vaccines. So these are weakened, but still technically living pathogens. Uh, we have inactivated vaccines or killed vaccines. So these are in intact organisms that are that are killed or um, inactivated, meaning they're no longer able to actually um, reproduce. Um, these would be inactivated using either heat killing or some sort of preservative like formaldehyde. Um, we also have vaccines called subunit vaccines. So these are components, little pieces of the pathogen. So these could be things like little sugars or little protein components of a bacteria or a virus. Um, and then we have something called toxoid vaccines. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of those and, and use a couple of examples so people can kind of visualize this. So, so Andrea, if I could just ask a quick question. So the flu shot that, that I got yesterday and that most of us are getting, um, what is that? What type of vaccine is that? That is an inactivated vaccine. So it's an intact influenza, um, but it's actually killed so it can't actually reproduce. Because I always get the question, I've, I've received this question from friends, friends and family for years now, you know, well, not even a question. They told me, oh, well, I know someone or, I, you know, I got the shot a couple of years ago and it gave me the flu. So let's just clear the air right now really quickly. That is not what happened. <laughs> the flu vaccine, as you just said, it's inactivated, right? So it cannot give us the flu. So just uh, if we could just talk very briefly about this. So the two things that might be happening are one, maybe we were just going to get sick anyway, right? With something entirely different from the flu or B, maybe it's just our immune system signaling to us that it's mounting an immune response against the flu. It's telling us that the, that the shot is actually working. But again, that's very different from, from saying that it gave us the flu. Is all of that accurate? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, with the vaccines that we routinely get, we usually most people have some sort of mild response to it. And often that's just soreness at the injection site. Um, And that's and that's ultimately or, you know, mild fever, things like that. And that's ultimately, again, because what you're doing with these vaccinations is you're mimicking, you're saying, hey, I just put something that is, you know, a a foreign pathogen into my body immune system, you need to recognize this and fight it off. And so that very mild uh, response is, in fact, your immune system fighting it off without actually getting ill. Um, And so in the case, especially uh, for the flu vaccine, it's it's not even uh, an attenuated virus, it's completely inactivated. So there's no possible way that you can actually get the flu from the flu shot. You heard it here, folks. I don't want to ever hear that question (laughs) again. (laughs) And you know, Andrea, vaccines like any medication or anything we put into our body, and even if we drank too much water, right, there there could be some side effect. Um, And and as you just said, most of the side effects are are very minor soreness or maybe some fussiness, low-grade fever, especially in young kids. But they typically only last a couple of days and are, are, are treatable, and serious reactions are very rare. Um, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, I was, was going to say, yeah, absolutely. And and these are all expected. Um, you know, a vaccine would not be released to the general public if there were significant safety issues or serious reactions that were, um, you know, more frequent than, you know, one in several hundred thousand or one in a million um, in most instances. And and obviously we will get into safety of vaccinations and clinical trials on a future episode. I don't want to get into the weeds too much on that here, but suffice it to say that um, any vaccination that's commercially available um, are thoroughly tested for both safety and, and um, you know, efficacy before being available for public consumption. Mm-hmm. So did you want to tell us anything, maybe highlight some differences between the types of vaccines? I sure, feel absolutely. like I cut you off. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. So yeah, so um, so the four classes of vaccines that we have available now, um, the first is your live attenuated vaccines. So these are weakened. Um, attenuated is just another word for weakened um, form of the pathogen that causes the disease in question. And so the good thing with these types of vaccines is because they are so similar to the actual actual disease in question, they tend to cause very potent or or elicit very potent immune responses and very potent uh, long-term immunity. Um, and so this is this is generally good. This means that you typically don't need to get annual vaccines or, or boosters that frequently. Um, however, if you are immunocompromised uh, because, say, you're a transplant recipient or you have a, a, an immune immune disease condition or um, are getting treated for cancer or things like that, this could lead to more serious side effects in these types of vaccines just because they are um, they elicit a pretty potent immune response. But um, these also don't store that well, um, so they have to be kept refrigerated. So they're not great for countries that have limited access to um, storage facilities and things like that. But examples of these types of vaccines would be the MMR, um, the rotavirus vaccine, which is hugely prevalent. Uh, rotavirus is very debilitating for especially children. Um, smallpox vaccine, the chickenpox vaccine, so that's the varicella zoster vaccine, and then yellow fever vaccine as well. Um, The next category would be those inactivated vaccines. And so these are basically an intact pathogen, but they're killed. They're completely inactivated. um, So they can't reproduce. They can't um, they can't cause active disease. Now, attenuated vaccines can't cause active disease either, um, but they can reproduce in your body, which is typically why you don't need to get a booster of it. Um, But they're not actually going to cause the disease in question because they don't have a component of that pathogen that could actually cause the illness. Um, and Andrew, ahead, so yes. we just said, you know, that, sorry. So the flu vaccine is an example of inactivated, um, I think is polio, the polio vaccine. Yes. That's another. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to clarify that a little bit. Um, cause there, there are, or were two types of polio vaccine, but the, the injectable polio vaccine is an inactivated vaccine, um, as is hepatitis A and the rabies vaccine. So the rabies vaccine is, is not something you're going to commonly encounter unless you're an animal worker or a researcher, or you've had a potential exposure to a rabid animal. Um, but that one is also, so the polio vaccine is an interesting case because there, there was actually two types of polio vaccine. There was an oral 
oral polio called the Sabin vaccine. This one was a, a weakened virus. And um, this is actually the only vaccine that has ever been shown to cause what we call vaccine-derived polio. Um, now, this vaccine, um, the oral one, the the weakened version um, has not been used in the United States since then, since 2000. Um, it was used in, in developing countries because it was very stable and easy to transport. Um, but we haven't used it globally since 2019 and we've actually eradicated wild polio. So um, that's much less of a concern. Um, those cases of vaccine derived polio were very, very rare. Um, and that just happened to be uh, just unique to that particular vaccine. We use the inactivated injectable vaccine here um, nowadays. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. Go on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> really interesting. So, so inactivated vaccines, again, they're intact pathogens, um, you know, viruses um, here in this case. And then the next category would be subunit vaccines. Um, and so subunit vaccines are typically a piece of the pathogen. So it could be a, a piece of a protein that's recognized by the immune system. Um, it could be, um, you know, the capsid protein, which is the casing, the outer shell of the virus in question, or even could be a piece of a sugar in the case of some bacteria. Um, and that's, and that's because, you know, those pieces are the components of those pathogens that are recognized by our immune system as not being self, right? They're not hmm. human. Um, and and um, typically, they actually do elicit a very potent immune response because they're very specific and they're very unique to that particular disease. Um, and because they don't have any of the potential risks of a really... Um, potent immune response against, say, an attenuated virus, they can be used in pretty much all um, classes of, of people in the population, even those that have weakened immune systems or, or potential health, um, you know, uh, co comorbidities. Um, huh. the, the challenge with these, though, is because they're only a component of the pathogen, sometimes you do need boosters for these, which means maybe every three to five years, you might need to get a second vaccine or you may get a series in the beginning because that second vaccination, um, you know, actually it, it improves the immune response to it. So um, examples of this would be the um, human papilloma virus vaccine. So HPV, that's a leading cause of a variety of cervical cancers. Um, hepatitis B vaccine is an example of this. The whooping cough, so that's the uh, one of the components in the DTaP or Tdap vaccines, um, as well as pneumococcal and meningococcal diseases. And um, some of the trends with these is that these tend to be um, bacterial related diseases. Um, you can't obviously, you're not going to inject a whole bacteria into a person. So these subunit vaccines often serve the goal of protecting against these very detrimental bacterial diseases. Now, Andrea, my understanding is that for subunit vaccines, because only parts of the, the virus, bacteria, pathogen, uh, because only parts of them are being used instead of the entire germ, um, that side effects are much less common for these vaccines. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's why people that have um, immune system issues, whether they're immunocompromised because they're a transplant recipient or because they have uh, immunodeficiency from another reason, or because they have some sort of pre-existing condition, that's why these vaccines are generally safe for them to take as well. Okay, that makes sense. So, so far we've talked about live attenuated, inactivated, mm -hmm. subunit. Okay, take yep. us home. What's so, the fourth? <laughs> so the fourth one that we have available are toxoid vaccines. And these are very important for diseases that um, the disease itself is not caused because of the pathogen, but it's be caused by a toxin that the pathogen produces. So a toxin is a harmful product that the, the, the pathogen produces. And that is the piece that actually causes the symptoms of the disease. Um, and so the toxoid vaccine will protect us against um, any of the detrimental effects of the toxin itself. And again, these are going to be very similar to your subunit where you likely will need boosters periodically. A really great example of this is tetanus. So tetanus um, is caused by a bacteria, but the disease and the fatality associated with tetanus is caused by the toxin that the tetanus bacteria produces. Um, and so so tetanus, typically, if you haven't had an exposure or a possible exposure, uh, you get a booster every 10 years or so. Um, another
another example of a toxoid vaccine would be diphtheria. Um, and again, a very, very uh, detrimental disease that the disease itself is caused by the, the toxin itself. Um, now, there are other vaccine candidates that we haven't talked about, and that's because they don't officially exist in a uh, commercially available vaccine. But these are um, in play with regard to COVID-19. And we're going to discuss these much more in depth at a later episode. Um, mm-hmm. But the future of vaccines is also leading to what we call nucleic acid vaccines. So these could be DNA or RNA vaccines, as well as vector-based vaccines. Now, none of these are officially um, available in any of the existing vaccines that we routinely get, but it really is where the technology is going. That's awesome. Um, okay. So let's just do a really quick recap here. So live attenuated, these vaccines do contain a version of the living virus or bacteria, but it's been weakened, attenuated, right? Right. Um, and so does not cause disease in, in people with healthy immune systems. Then we talked about inactivated vaccines um, that are by definition, inactivated, right? We're, we're killing the, the germ in the process of making the vaccine. Um, stop me if I'm saying anything uh, incorrectly here. Um, next, I think you talked about subunit, and that's where we're only using parts of the virus or bacteria, uh, subunits instead of the entire germ. Mm-hmm. And then finally, you talked about toxoid vaccines. Um, and so there, I think you're saying that these prevent disease uh, by bacteria that produce toxins. And in the process of making the vaccines, the toxins are weakened so they can't cause illness. And again, these weakened toxins are the toxoids. (laughs) Is that right? Yeah, essentially. So Uh basically- I said something wrong. No, 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 no. (laughs) Nope, nope. Okay. So basically with all of these, you know, the goal is we're, we're trying to elicit the most potent memory immunity, um, you know, with the lowest, the lowest risk. Um, and so, you know, um, these types of vaccines, the reason we have all these different types is because certain pathogens are better protected against um, with that weakened intact virus or, or um, pathogen. Um, whereas we, with others, we can get really effective protection with just a component of them, like in the case of a sub unit. Um, but that's a really great summary of the different types of vaccines and some examples that we we work with these days. So, uh, Andrea, if you had anything more to say about that, uh, uh, please keep going. But I, another question that seems relevant um, is whether natural immunity is better than vaccination. Yeah, um, absolutely. So and I'll just give my two cents and then please, please jump in. But, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to, you know, I do understand that some people, you know, they see, they see a shot filled with you know, chemicals and they're very scared of injecting something into their bodies. Right. And so they're saying, no, natural immunity is better. People throw chicken pox parties <laughs> for their kids. But what they're failing to recognize is that there are serious risks, including death of these natural infections. So even something that seems like a harmless childhood illness, natural chickenpox, varicella, um, it could be very dangerous, right? It could lead to pneumonia. Um, There's also complications due to shingles recurrence. Uh, We talk about, let's, let's talk about the polio infection. Oh, sorry, Andrea. I just want to jump in there. So, yeah. So, um, you know, this is something that's very unique to to chickenpox virus itself, but it basically establishes uh, long term dormancy in your body. And so, shingles is a reactivation of that virus. Um, it's true for any of the herpes virus family viruses. Um, but the issue with shingles is it's not just painful and debilitating, but depending on where the shingles outbreak recurs in your body, it can actually cause death um, for encephalitis or meningitis or things like that because that virus lives in um, neurons in your body. And so if it if it reestablishes or re, um, erupts in your facial nerves, it can actually kill you. So it's not just a, a simple childhood illness that you get a little rash from and then you're done with. Right. And and just the, the, the thought that I was um, about to finish was that uh, when we think about polio, that's another one that could cause permanent paralysis. I mean, these are these are things to be taken very seriously. And and again, you know, we're talking about these complications. We're also talking about death. So vaccines are a much safer path 
uh, to immunity in, in some of these instances. And it sounds like you agree. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say it's a safer path to immunity in all of these instances. Um, oh, good. You know, okay. um, yes, there are cases where there's a legitimate allergy to a component of a vaccine. And, and that's going to be something that, you know, a very rare proportion of people may experience. But, you know, again, I, these are e extremely and rigidly tested for safety. Um, and certainly, you know, you may be the person that gets a mild case of, you know, polio, but but you can't hinge your, you know, you can't hang your hat on that, um, you know, assumption or, or hope, um, ultimately. Absolutely. Um, and so, Andrea, when people say, you know, okay, if you're vaccinated, why do you care if I'm vaccinated? What What do you say to people? I'm sure you get that question a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And, and you know, I know, Jess, you touched on herd immunity in, in our last episode. But, you know, the the with vaccination, obviously, as you just heard, there are certain types of vaccines available that some people can't get, um, whether that's because of an age group restriction or because they're immune compromise or because they're too young to get it at this point. Um, so having a, a large proportion of the population vaccinated ensures that even those who medically, truly medically are unable to get that vaccine will be protected through that that phenomenon called herd or community immunity. Um, we need a minimum number of people to be vaccinated, be protected in order to prevent those infections from taking root. And as we saw in these measles recurrences, these small pocket outbreaks, when you have a population that is not vaccinated, that um, that's now very susceptible, that infection can really take root and spread very quickly. Jess, Absolutely. I know you have some thoughts yeah. about um, about herd immunity from a population I, health perspective. I sh I sure do. Um, I'll just you know we we're scientists, Andrea, and so we live uh, and breathe evidence. So I just want to talk uh, again about some real numbers here. Let's talk some about case studies. Uh, so we we've been talking about measles quite a bit, and I just want to reiterate nearly. Everyone in this country got measles before there was a vaccine. Uh, hundreds would die from it every single year. And today, most doctors have never seen a case. Uh, and unfortunately, as, as I mentioned before, we're, we're now seeing a resurgence of measles. And that's just totally preventable. And it kills me as a, as a public health practitioner. I know it kills you as, a, as an immunologist. Um, some, other, some other examples, uh, more than 15 thousand Americans died from diphtheria in 1921 before we had a vaccine. Since then, uh, well, actually, uh, well, there were only two cases of diphtheria reported to the CDC between 2004 and 2014. Another example is rubella, also known as German measles. So between 1964 and 1965, 12 and a half million Americans had rubella, 2,000 babies died, and there were 11,000 miscarriages attributed to this disease. Since 2012, we've only seen 15 cases of rubella reported to the CDC. So the evidence is there. It's all very clear. Uh, vaccines work. And I, I'm really scared that we're moving in a direction where we're undoing so many decades of incredible uh, you know, pu public health advancement in, in the world of uh, preventable disease and population health. And I'm so worried that we're going to see a resurgence of all of these really scary uh, diseases. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, the the goal of this is to really kind of alleviate some of these concerns of vaccines to provide some insight as to what they're actually made of. Um, we will have an episode about safety and clinical trials and testing of vaccines. We also will probably have a future episode trying to dispel some of the myths or misconceptions about vaccines. Um, but I think the, the big takeaway from this episode is that um, there are a variety of different types of vaccines. They serve to safely mimic the actual disease that they're preventing against, um, whether that be because they're a weakened version of that disease, um, they're actually an outright killed or inactivated version, or they're a component of the disease-causing organism that will safely mimic 
um, trigger that memory immunity from the adaptive immune response, which is your B cells, your antibodies, and your T cells, and ultimately prevent these um, significant disease and death burdens on society. Um, ultimately, you know, the goal of these is to mitigate a lot of these um, public health crises that we're obviously seeing right now with a, a novel disease and ensure that, you know, we're safely protected in the future. Jess, is there anything else you want to say uh, before we wrap up? There's a lot I want to say, but I'm <laughs> going to bite, bite my tongue and wait for a future episode. And I, I think you said this before, Andrea, I just want to reiterate, you know, of course, everyone is very curious about the COVID-19 vaccine. And so we will do a deeper dive into that vaccine in a future episode. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We hope you learned a thing or two. In our next episode, we're going to take a little break from vaccines and, and immune system stuff, but we're going to discuss the evidence-based do's and don'ts for living in the time of COVID-19. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science.